Father, we pray that you speak to us in this session we have now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have the third study of our leadership study. And in this session, we're concentrating on the pastor in leadership. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are talking about the pastor in particular. In this passage of read, the Bible shows us that the pastor is a ministry gift. And he mentions other ministry gifts. He gave some apostles. Nobody makes himself an apostle. No church appoints an apostle. Christ himself gives us a gift. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. In the New Testament, the word pastor appears only here. But then, if you understand that the word pastor means a shepherd over the flock, a leader, a father over the family. Then you understand that the office of the pastor comes up many times in the New Testament. In fact, in every local church in the New Testament. In Jeremiah chapter 3, God had spoken through Jeremiah the prophet and he had prepared the minds of the people looking forward to the time when he himself will equip some leaders in the church as pastors. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. God told the children of Israel through Jeremiah, saying that they had been shepherds, that had not been according to his mind. They had been pastors that had not done the will of God in the flock, in the assembly. But that a time was coming that he will give pastors according to his own mind. And such pastors will feed the church with knowledge and with understanding. From the Bible perspective and from what we know normally in the church, the pastor occupies a strategic place in the church because of his function, because of what he's called to do. He's called to love the people of God. Without love, he cannot be a pastor. He may have knowledge. Knowledge without love will not qualify him to be a pastor. He may have what we call charisma that is able to motivate people. Without love, he will not be a pastor. He may have a lot of experience. Without love, he will not be a pastor. He may be a likable person, a likable personality, but he himself doesn't have the deep love of God. He cannot be a pastor. He is called to love. In his love, he encourages. In his love, he feeds. In his love, he teaches. In his love, he inspires the church. In his love, he keeps the people of God in love and commitment to the Lord. Understand what we're saying. A person may encourage. It's only when he does it in love, he's serving as a pastor. A person may feed the floor. He may teach the floor. It's only when he teaches and feeds in love that he's standing in a position of a pastor. A person may inspire. It is only when that inspiration is coming from the motive of love that is fulfilling the office of a pastor. 
He may keep other people in love, love to God, teach them consecration, and teach them commitment to the Lord. It's when he does it because of his love for them. He is consumed with love. Then he stands in the place of a pastor. And true to his privilege as pastor, he desires to serve. That's the functional word for the pastor. He desires to serve and to meet the needs of the people. He looks at them and he loves them. And he wants to serve them. He wants to reveal and manifest the grace and the mercy of God to those who are desperately in need of it. To lead sinners to Christ and to keep believers in Christ. To unite believers, members of the church, under Christ's headship. Somebody who has a divisive nature, who scatters people, discourages people, and tears the church apart by his counseling, by his preaching, by his ministration. He has the tendency to scatter. He has the tendency to tear apart. That's not a pastor. A pastor has the life, the ministry to unite people, to get people together. To make people love one another. And to get everyone under the headship of Christ. And to help the spiritually sick. The spiritually weak. And the spiritually poor and oppressed to trust in God. And to develop their faith. And to regain spiritual strength and victory. That's a pastor. The pastor cannot do his work or fulfill the ministry single handedly. He does not fulfill that ministry to the flock single-handedly, all alone by himself. What does he then do? He prayerfully chooses others in the fold to serve with him in ministering to God's people. If you find a person who is a lone ranger, who tries to do everything by himself alone, he may have a lot of talent, a lot of resources, a lot of ability. If he tries to do the work in the church alone, he's not a pastor. By calling, a pastor is a person who in love draws other people, magnetizes other people towards himself. And is able to make them do, even though he can do those things himself, but he enjoys making other people do it. He enjoys making other people have the privilege of serving along with him. That's a pastor. But a person who says, I'm so strong enough that I can run and jump and climb and work and function and serve all alone. I don't need anybody. That's not a pastor. A pastor by calling is a person who attracts people to himself. And he trains them. And he equips them. And he gives them responsibility like a father, like a leader, like a shepherd, like a master who is overseeing, like a coordinator who is coordinating, like a manager who is managing and is making sure that other people are able to do the work successfully. He chooses by calling and character, not just by ability of each person. He chooses after much prayer and seeking the face of the Lord. He chooses prayerfully after examining others' acceptance of each individual. A pastor has two ears, but then he hears with them. Has two eyes, he watches, he sees with them. He looks at that individual. He sees that the person may seem to have ability, but is not acceptable to the people. And because he is not acceptable to the people, the pastor wants to find out why is he not acceptable. Why will people not benefit when he ministers? And then he will choose people that have the calling, that have the character, that have the ability, that are acceptable to the people. And he determines the dedication of the people to Christ before he chooses them. He determines their love for souls. And their willingness to serve without vain glory. And their willingness to endeavor to keep the body of Christ in unity of spirit. And they handle everything in a matured way in the Lord. After prayerfully selecting the workers to serve and ministers along with him, the pastor will carefully and constantly give them direction and encouragement. You know, the person will call a pastor is a person who fulfills many functions, many roles, all at the same time. 
He can chastise in love and he can encourage in love. He can give responsibilities out and then he can direct them how to fulfill the responsibility. And he can tell people, hold people in check and tell them, don't do anything now. And they will be sitting down to see how they can glorify God by sitting down. And he can challenge people and motivate them and keep running in the work and all to the glory of God. And so he has many faces, many characteristics, and is able to do many things in different ways. He provides service opportunities and inspiration. He offers correction and hope. In a balanced way, in a constructive manner, it is the pastor that cultivates loyalty. You see, there are times that pastors will complain and say the people are not loyal. Well, it's the responsibility of the pastor to cultivate loyalty, to make the people loyal to God, loyal to the word of God, loyal to the church. And he cultivates trust and family spirit in the workers that you'll find that the workers are attached to one another. They care for one another. They visit one another. They love one another. And they help one another. It is the pastor that cultivates that. In a church where you find that a, a member is sick and the other members will not visit the sick member. A worker is down and the other workers will not go around to encourage that, that worker that is down. It's the fault of the pastor because it is the work, the function of the pastor to make sure that he maintains loyalty, trust, family spirit and maintains a forgiving spirit in the church. Now, people will offend one another. But from the attitude of the pastor, from the counseling of the pastor, from the ministration of the pastor, the pastor maintains a forgiving spirit, an honest attitude. The pastor can make people to be hypocritical the way he does his things. If uh, he appreciates people that have eye service, then the people in the church, they know that what to do is to have eye service. But if they know that he's looking for people that genuinely love the Lord, he is the one to cultivate an honest attitude, open communication channel. It is the pastor that can lessen gossiping in the church because they know that the pastor is open. If there is anything you want to point out, you are free to go to the pastor and you point it out, then people will not be gossiping. But if they know that the pastor doesn't welcome that kind of thing, you cannot talk then that pastor will be encouraging, gossiping, and backbiting in the church. But the pastor maintains open communication channel as all people get involved fully and freely in the work of the Lord in the church. There are two points we need to consider about the pastor. Number one, the pastor as a father. Number two, the pastor as a shepherd. If you are pastor of a local church, you need to think about those two points as father, as shepherd. And if you are a house fellowship leader, you are like a father over those people, though they are small in number. And you are like a shepherd over that little flock, though they are very small. Let's look at point one. The pastor as a father. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He said, You may have many instructors. You may have many teachers that can teach many useful lessons, but you have only one father. Paul was referring, or referring to himself as a pastor, as a father. And here is what a pastor needs to learn, that you cannot easily replace a real pastor. And you may have a lot of teachers. There are people that know doctrine, but they don't know people. There are people that are very, very firm and very conversant with the doctrines of the Bible, but then they do not love as pastors ought to love. 
you'll find those kinds of people saying, that's the word. Take it or leave it. That's a teacher, not a pastor. You'll find some of those people saying, I've taught you the truth. If you want to remain in the truth, take it. You want to leave the truth and get out of the church, bye-bye. Go to another church. The people who want here are people who love the Bible, stand on the Bible. That's a teacher, not a pastor. A pastor loves the word, loves the doctrine, and he loves the people. And a pastor weeps more than a teacher. When people leave the church, a teacher says, well, that's their problem. They don't like the Bible. They don't like the doctrine. They don't like the word of God, so we're not losing anything. Bye-bye. You want to go? Bye. That's a teacher. But a pastor, he loves the Bible. He teaches the Bible. He teaches the doctrines of the word of God. And when he loses anyone, he will cry as if somebody has died. That's a pastor. And Paul the Apostle said, Though you may have 10,000 instructors and teachers, people that can teach doctrine, you do not have as many fathers, because in the gospel I have begotten you unto the Lord. And you are coming to the Lord because you have a father that is concerned for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. As we look at all these verses of scripture, we need to realize what Paul the Apostle is saying. And we need to realize that what he said for that time is true for this day as well. That even today, there may be 10,000 instructors in the church, but not, uh, not nearly as many fathers. There are many scholars and there are many teachers. There are many bookworms, we can call them. They read a lot of books. But then the heart of, the, of a pastor, the heart of a spiritual father, they do not possess. Each local church needs a real pastor who has a heart for the people of God and has compassion for the needy. A leader who does not have the heart of a father will not manifest enough love, will not show enough mercy, will not show enough understanding and consequently will fail to be a true pastor. We need the Father's heart in the pastor so that that will make us to have compassion, have concern, have forgiveness, have sacrificial love in serving the church. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14 and verse 15. It said, Behold, the thought time. I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. The pastor is not looking for what he can get out of the people. The pastor is looking for what he can give to the people. Do you know sometimes your children might be dull. Your children might not be very sharp intellectually. But you still love those children more than other children in the neighborhood that are very sharp, that are academically brilliant. Because they are your children, you love them. You see, there are times that a pastor will leave, will leave the village church and uh, will say, what's the matter? Well, he says, post me to another place. I cannot be in that village church. Why? Well, they cannot support me. They cannot give me all the money I need. And they cannot give me all the food I need. And the place I'm living, they cannot even furnish that house. And since that church is not uh, knowledgeable enough, is not uh, rich enough to be able to supply all my need, I cannot be there. And I want to be posted to another place. Where do you like to go? I like to go to that place, for example, or that place, for example, or that place, for example. Where do you like that place? Well, I see that uh, uh, since the pastor there, since he got there within a short time, is riding a vehicle. And he can give him the money he needs. I see that his children are well dressed. I see that his wife is well dressed. I want a church like that. That pastor, that kind of leader is looking for what he can get. Not what he can give. Paul the apostle said, I seek not yours. You may have money. I'm not going to check up that. You may have material things. I'm not interested in that. I'm not looking for what belongs to you. I'm looking for you. 
for the children, ought not to lay for the parents. Lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love, the less I be loved. Now can you see the characteristic of the pastor here? It means that in a time when that church is having problem in the community, you are not going to run away. Even if they want to transfer you at that time, you will be pleading and saying, um, Overseer, the church is going through a traumatic time, a difficult time. And the members of the church, they don't have enough to eat. And the members of the church have been seriously persecuted. And the members of the church are going through more than they can handle. I think if a new pastor comes and he takes over, he may not know how to really be with the people, sympathize with the people, support the people. But I know them. I know what they are going through. I know what they are suffering. And uh, overseer, if you can allow me to suffer with them a little, because they don't have enough to eat, that's the father's heart. That's a real pastor. He wants to be with the people while the people are suffering. He doesn't want to, you know, stay in a far place and stay all alone by himself and say, well, uh, the people now, they don't have any food to eat. I'm going to go to a place where there's enough food to eat. They do not have material things. I'm going to go to a place where they have material things. Not only that, it may be that the people are hard. It's hard soil, hard ground. And when you preach, the people are not able to get what you are preaching. And they are not able to pray. A real pastor will say, I want to stay here more. So that whatever is hardened in their heart, so that whatever is difficult on this soil, I'll break it up. And if they want to send another person, he'll be pleading, he'll be saying, these people are difficult. And these people have a lot of difficulties. And it appears that we have not been able to break the, so the soil or the ground. I think I'd like to stay here for some time and suffer more with them. I want to discover what it will take. If it will take fasting, if it will take praying, if it will take loving them, if it will take sacrifice and self-denial, I want to discover what it takes so that I can be of help to them. That's a pastor. But the person that is saying, when are they going to change me? What am I going to live in this place? Or do they want me to die in this place? In this difficult place? The people are not cooperating. The people are not prayerful. The people are not yielding to the word of God. The people are traditionally minded. When are they going to remove me from this place? And will go to the overseer and say, What have I done? That you are keeping me in this place all the time. I'm going to die if I remain in this place. My spiritual life is going to just be completely, uh, become nothing. If I stay in this place, take me out of this place. Where do you want to go? Uh, that place where you don't have to preach much and you will be praying. That place where they revive. That place where everything is going on very well. And you don't have to, you don't have to fast. You don't have to break any solid ground before you plant. That's the place I want to go. That's not a pastor. A pastor is somebody that he wants to love the people. He wants to sacrifice. He's a real shepherd who puts his life in his hand, wanting to serve the people. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. From verse 7. But we were gentle among you, as a nurse cherishes her children. We were gentle among you. As a nurse cherishes her children. I hope you see something here. Let me point it out to you. We. That's masculine. A nurse cherishing her children. That's feminine. You see many times men who are pastors. They have masculine attitude. And they handle things like men. Like soldiers. Put it down. Take it up, go this direction, march left, march right, straight forward, go on. They march like soldiers. But it says we, we men, who normally are masculine, who normally will have masculine characteristics. When we became pastors and we became people like shepherds over the church of God, something changed on the inside. And we became gentle. Not as gentle as men, but as gentle as nursing mothers cherishing their children. You see, there will be that gentleness in you. Gentleness should characterize every pastor. In his attitude to people and his dealings with members of the church. But the aggressive nature, 
the masculine nature, the one that will break people, the one that will deal with people as if they were not human beings, the ones that doesn't know how to be gentle, how to be soft, will not be in the nature of the pastor, the person that can say something to another fellow and, and he will not explain. And he will not worry if that person is disturbed, if that person is unhappy. That's not a pastor. A pastor is a person who cares for the feelings of people. And even when you want to correct people, you know how to correct the people as a nursing mother. How you'll be gentle. How you'll be soft. How you'll be very mild upon the people. Gentleness describes the loving, tender, fatherly touch that all children must have during their development. A pastor may be strong. When one is teaching doctrine, he has to be strong. But unless he has the balance of gentleness, it will hurt the people of God seriously. Let's say, for example, a pastor has discovered that somebody has done something wrong. And the pastor wants to correct that individual. How does the pastor correct? The pastor will correct not like a soldier, like a nursing mother. The pastor will correct, not like the olden days headmasters. You remember the olden days headmaster with white knicker, white shirt, and with a big stick in their hand. And once that headmaster is coming, you know that today, a look at his face and look at his short and knicker, you know something is going to happen today. A pastor doesn't act like that, but with gentleness. And even when he's going to correct a person, he will take time to explain. He will say, my brother or house fellowship leader, or area leader, or zona leader, see what you have done. And he's so concerned himself. And as a nursing mother, with all gentleness, will explain and say, you see, if you continue like this, this thing will destroy the church. If you act like this, the people will misunderstand your attitude. And actually, you need time to pray. And you need time to face the Lord and settle everything with the Lord. And I hope you will pray. And I'm praying along with you too. I'm so sorry and I'm so sad. I have to stop you at this time. But you know what could I do? And Because if I don't stop you, the work will spoil. And then the judgment of God upon you on the last day will be very terrible. So my brother, please go and pray. And go and settle this problem. If you settle the problem, the moment you settle, come back. And come and tell me. I want to know you are getting on in the Lord. Not a person that will just call a person and say, go and pray. What have I done, sir? Go and pray. Have I made any mistake? Go and pray. Anything I'm not doing right, go and pray. Now you need to be like a nursing mother. That you will take time to explain. Because when you just say, go and pray. And the person doesn't know what have I done, in which way am I, have I gone wrong, what am I supposed to correct in my life. If we do not have the gentleness of a pastor, we will destroy those people. Those people may search and search and search and find nothing. And sometimes with tears in their eyes, they come back and they say, our pastor. Or is it because, uh, you know, we're so many in the church, we're now getting up to 200. Is that why you are just dealing like this with me? I said, go and pray. That's not a pastor. If you are a pastor, you will have the gentleness. And you will deal with each individual in a soft, mild, gentle manner. The servant of the Lord, the Bible says, must not strive, but be gentle. And the Bible says the wisdom that is from above must first be pure and peaceable and gentle. And you see how Paul the Apostle said, we were gentle among you. Now, when I look at Paul the Apostle, I can know that if it's possible for Paul to be gentle, it's possible for any other person to be gentle. Because, you know, before Paul was converted, he will take letters in his hand, and he will get into any house, and he never looked at any woman crying, any man crying. He will take the men and the women, he will take them into prison and lock them up. And he was going to Damascus and really marching on gallantly, saying, when I get to Damascus, I am going to get those people and I'm going to deal with them. Now, when you know a person like that, eventually he became converted. Eventually, he became a preacher of the gospel and his nature changed completely. His nature changed completely. You know, the problem with some of us, pastors, is that our nature has not changed. And it's a pity. What I mean is this, when you were very young and you were going to primary school, you were not born again at that time. 
when you were going by the side of the road, you saw how the headmaster was beating you. Stretch out your hand and will beat you like you are nobody's child. And then when you are coming back from school and you remember how the headmaster beat you, you will take a stick and you will see the leaves on the side of the road. And you will say, stretch out your hand and you will beat all those leaves and destroy all the leaves by the side of the road. That's what you are when you are very young. You say, when I get old, I'm going to be a teacher. And all those children in the primary school, I will beat them. They will know that I'm a real headmaster. Now you became a pastor and that same attitude has not left you. That's why some people don't know what it means to be gentle. But you know Paul the Apostle, even though he was like that before he was born again, when he became born again, everything changed. And Paul said, we were gentle among you. Another thing is this, even after Paul the Apostle became an apostle, when he went on missionary journeys, if you see him dealing with the devil, that man was bold. You remember what I read to you last night when he faced that man and he said, Oh, full of all subtlety, child of the devil, you'll be blind for a season. When Paul the apostle dealt with demons and devils, he was, he was a character. Very bold, very firm, very authoritative. But when he dealt with members of the church, he was totally different. And he asked the people, what should I come with? Should I come with a rod? Or should I come with another thing? Because the way I find you now, I fear. Lest when I come, my Lord will humble me before you. And I will weep because of those who have sinned and have not repented. Look at his father talking. Look at his gentleness. When he dealt with the devil, very firm, very bold, very aggressive, very authoritative. When he dealt with members in the church, he said, we were gentle among you. As a nurse cherishes her own children. Now the problem with some pastors is that they do not know the difference between devil and believer. The way they deal with demons. The, de the way they deal with devils is the same way they will deal with members in the church. Aggressive, authoritative, brutal, unkind, and unbending, unyielding. Paul the apostle said, we were gentle. And what a lesson for us. That we as pastors will be gentle. That's the nature of the pastor. The pastor is not necessarily an apostle. There is a way an apostle will manifest authority. The pastor is not necessarily an evangelist. The pastor is not necessarily a teacher. Just teach and teach and teach. The pastor is a father. And that quality of the father we have to see in the pastor. It says wisdom. That is from above will be pure. And the pastor that has wisdom will know to keep the church pure, peaceable, and gentle. Will be gentle among the people of God as he not cherishes her own children. Because ye were dear unto us. Look at verse 8. For being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Because ye were dear unto us. You are dear unto us. That's how you know a pastor. That's why a pastor can stay in the same place for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years, and he remains in that place in dry season and rainy season, in harvest time and in the time of farming, in time when there is money, time when there is no money, in times when there is storm in that church, and in times when everything is peaceful in the church, he remains with that church because the people are dear unto him. He knows them by name. He knows their peculiar problems one by one. He's praying for them in the night, in the day, all the time. They are dear unto him. Because of that, he's so much attached unto them. And because of that attachment, he remains with them. But there are some people who say they are pastors. They're easily fed up with the congregation. They say, when, I'm going, when am I going to be transferred? I spent six months in this place. When am I going to be transferred? Why do you want to be transferred? The, your children are there. Your people are there. They should be dear unto you. Other people will say, I've already spent two years in this place. When am I going to be transferred? And then they'll be saying, I'm praying that they will relocate me. They will post me out to another place. Why do you want to go to another place? A pastor will like to stay there. And it may be 40 years or 50 years, the pastor still enjoys that place because the people there are dear unto him. 
Look at verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For labor in night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Paul the apostle said that he even walked with his son. When those people were not able to maintain him physically, there are some pastors that will be complaining, that will say, I don't know what is wrong with this local church. The farm, they said, uh, we should develop for the retreat. The, the farm is so small. The house where they put me, the place is so hot, there is no fun. And all the things I ought to be having, there is, there is no benefit I have in this church. I wonder what is happening to them. Then go and walk with your hand. And they say, no, I am full time. That's what some people say. They carry the label, full time pastor, full time pastor. And they, they wake up in the morning, early in the morning, they are still having this long tree stick in their mouth. At nine o'clock, they have their wrapper, uh, you know, at their waist, and they are throwing out about, and they say, ah, pastor, what is the problem today? No work. Well, my people come in the evening for study. It's only in the evening we are going to be busy. You have nothing, do you know, from morning at 11 o'clock in the morning, the man is still having to stick and spitting all around the compound. That's the pastor we see today in many places. But Paul the Apostle said, when that church cannot support me and sustain me, I labor and with labor and travail. They work with their hand night and day. The people that they have teaching a, a certificate, they cannot teach. They will say, I am full time. And the people, they say they are full time on, those people go to their farms and offices in the morning. Instead of saying, well, I know this church is small. I know this church cannot support me. Therefore, I'm willing to use my certificate. I will teach. And then since the schools will close in the afternoon, I still have all the time. And I will pastor this small group of people, and I'll be willing to work with my hand. But no, they will not do that. They don't want to work at all. A real pastor will want to do everything necessary, so that he can take care of the people of God. Then in verse 10, Ye are witnesses and God also, how holily, and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. As a father does his children. I'm going to ask you a question. You have children. And then one of those children is a difficult child. And one of those children is just almost incorrigible. What are you going to do with that child? Are you going to say, child, you are going to school this morning. When you get to school, stay there. Don't come home. Stay with the headmaster. And then you write to the headmaster. You say, headmaster, I give you as a gift. I dash you. Take the child. You don't do that. You will do everything you can do to make sure that that child is corrected. And we, we have prayer requests of people that have children that will steal their money. And they will steal sometimes their radio. They will steal a lot of things in their, in their home. They will go and sell. And these parents are not going to drive away the children. They will be praying that God will change their children. We are too quick in driving away our own children. We say, don't come back home. Don't come back to this church. Don't come back to this place. Stay with the headmaster at school. You will learn your lesson there that I cannot teach you. It's the father that will teach his own children. Spend time with them. A spiritual father in the house of God must develop this quality of gentleness. It is the heart attitude that will make him to be sensitive to other people and will teach all these people in difficult situations. And there may be difficult subjects which he has to handle. He will handle that subject without hurting the people of God. You know, sometimes there are times that a person may have two wives and he has come to the church and he didn't know about two wives or three wives. He just came to the church and he came to the Lord. He repented of his sins and then he became born again. And then while you are preaching, if you are just a teacher and not a pastor, you will say, if you have two wives and you have not taken care of that, well, I'm sorry for you, you are going to hell. That's a teacher. A man who is a pastor will know how that man will feel. That this second wife or third wife had been with this man for 15 years, for 20 years. Although he knows that he will do restitution, he has feeling for that man. 
that this person is going to tell the second wife they had been together for 10 years, for 15 years, is going to tell him, is going to tell her, I'm sorry, look at the word of God. I know we are attached together. I know some things connect us together. I know how we have been moving together. We love one another, but now I'm born again. And I have to do this. You see, there are some people who say they are pastors in a church. A person will come and he says, uh, Pastor, I have a problem. I have uh, two wives. The other one is a very young fellow. And we just married some five years ago. And now has three children for me. Now, I know that I should do restitution. But uh, I'm finding it difficult. That I should send away the younger one and keep this old woman that cannot do anything. And the person, if you are not a real pastor, you will say, Why are you coming to me? Already you say you know what to do. Hey, if you want to get to heaven, go and do it. You don't want to get to heaven, good luck to you. Bye bye. Pastor, no encouragement. What encouragement do you need again? You know the Bible, you know the truth, you know what to do, go and do it. How am I going to do it? This thing is difficult. If you want to make heaven, it will not be difficult. If you want to go to hell, go ahead and go to hell because of a woman. That's not a pastor. A pastor will cry with that man. Will say, I know how you feel. But look at the word of God. God will help you. God will give you grace. We are all praying for you. I'm concerned for you. I know you love the Lord. Don't let this little thing hinder you from getting to heaven. You, you must make heaven. Where Abraham has gone, Isaac has gone, Jacob has gone. All these people, they endure tribulation. They endure their own trial. You endure your own trial. I know how difficult it's going to be for you to go back home and tell that woman, but you will not die if you say, go and say it. Go and tell the woman. I know the woman may make trouble. We are all supporting you. We are all praying for you. That heaven, you will make heaven. My brother, I want to find you in heaven when I get there. If I get to heaven and I don't see you there, I'll be miserable. You will do it. We are praying for you. Then you kneel down and you pray as if you are the one to do restitution. The man will be encouraged. The man will go back home. He will make restitution. But the person that does not have a pastor's heart and will say, that's the Bible, take it or leave it, stay or go. That's the word of God. That's the doctrine. That's not, that's not a pastor. I pray God will develop many of us as pastors in Jesus' name. Amen. Difficult subjects and difficult things that the people have to do. You will say those things and you will teach those weighty, serious things as a father will give admonition and instruction to the children. And you will think of leading the church as little as you lead little children. Some people are too firm. Firmness without gentleness will destroy the ministry of the pastor. There must be the family spirit, the nursing, the caring, the gentleness, the serving of one another, the teaching and the loving of the members in a spiritual way. You see, the pastor is like a father in the family. Maybe he has to correct, but then he will correct and counsel at the same time. He has to rebuke. He will rebuke and love at the same time. He has his responsibilities, and those responsibilities must be balanced. Now, those who know how a father actually ought to behave, they tell us, and those who have studied the Bible, that the father is always a balanced man. And the father can keep his family in check, in control. But then, at the same time, there is much, much love. You, you know, sometimes uh, you have a family where it is all discipline. Like when I was a little boy, it was all discipline. No smile, no laughter. I, I, I can't remember my father ever laughing in my presence. I, I guess he loved being a human being, but not in my presence. I can't see my father at that time ever smiling in my presence. If he did, maybe once or twice in all my long years staying at home. All I saw my father doing is that when he's coming, are you playing? You're not taking your books? You are not reading? You bad boy? And he's looking for a stick. Some pastors are like that. Are you sitting down? You are not doing this, you are not doing that, and he's already looking for a stick. And then after my father would have beaten you. And I thought my father would know that when a little child is beaten, that that thing is painful, that tears will come. If I find you cry, if I see those tears, now what are we going to do? 
if he is beating you and you don't cry, that means he has not beaten you enough. He will beat you very well so that you will feel that thing. If you are crying, he will say, if I find you crying there, now, what are we going to do? You don't cry, you are in trouble. You cry, you are in trouble. Discipline. And then develop closer relationship at the same time chastise and forgive at the same time be forthright be gentle at the same time teach with authority but with a heart of compassion at the same time that means the pastor as a father he must nurture and love and admonish and be gentle and instruct and nourish and correct and forgive and chastise and be kind and warn and encourage and rebuke and comfort and speak the truth and be merciful all in a balanced way that he will develop and mature the flock over the which God has made him an overseer. That's why it is not an easy thing to be a pastor. We have to pray and we have to get the real spirit of God and the mind of Christ in us so that we will be the real pastor that God wants us to be. Point two, the pastor as a shepherd. Number one, I've said the pastor is a father. And you've seen that in the word of God. Number two, the pastor as shepherd. In John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. The wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. Now it's just uh, what I've been discussing and what I've been telling you. That a real shepherd will not run away from the flock when there is trouble. When the wolves are coming. When the false prophets are coming. When there is a difficult situation that the flock, that the people in the church are facing. A real shepherd will not run away. It is a hireling that will run away and look for safety. And look for a place to hide himself so that he will not partake in the trouble with the sheep. A, a shepherd will give even his very life. And he will want to suffer with those people. Now as we look at this picture of the shepherd, we have touched on it in the other parts of the studies. But let us just understand this, that the word shepherd is a very descriptive title for the pastor. It describes the function of the pastor as that of giving tender, sincere, intimate, spiritual, loving care to the sheep in the flock. You see, the pastor is not a person that has a detached life. His life is involved with the life of the sheep. His life is involved with the life of the members of the flock. And he gives care, tender care, tender care. And uh, I, I remember when I was very young, if I had any soul, in my leg. I preferred my mother washing that saw rather than my father washing that saw. And my father all the time, I don't know why he liked it, he liked to, wa to wash my saws. And I would say, mommy will do it. Just shut up. Because, uh, you know, mommy will wash it like a woman. You know what I mean? Will wash it like somebody who knows that something will pain you. But daddy, he, d he didn't have the time. And you can tell he didn't have the time. And therefore he will take that hot water and the thing will be burning his hand and the thing will be terrible for him. He'll be doing like this. <laughs> then he'll say, put your leg down. <laughs> and if I try to cry, he will look at me and say, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you know, if you are a shepherd, you wash the sword like a mother. You don't wash the saw like my big daddy. You'll be gentle. You'll be caring. You'll be tender. The way you are washing that saw, you see, that is the life of the pastor. That tenderness will be in you. You will know that people feel pain. You will know that that saw is very painful. You will know that that water, although you have to apply that water, you have to. And in those days, we didn't have all this, uh, all this medicine that we have now that he used in treating so. Uh, the only medicine my father knew to have in treating so for little children is iodine. 
and you know he'll take that hot water put it on it and then sometimes he will make the he will dip that thing in the hot water and then he will take it off like this and you know the drop of the hot water will be getting on the soul you mustn't remove that leg if you remove that leg you're in trouble and after all that then iodine will come you know what i was thinking i said if this man will die and to remain my mother alone and my mother will know how to treat us little children you know don't be a pastor like that that will wash a painful soul a painful situation it's, you know we have painful situations in families we have painful sores in our personal lives. We have painful sores in some things in our lives. Very touchy and very, very painful. A pastor will know how to correct, how to heal that wound. A pastor will know how to treat everything that all the pain will be removed and will be gentle. And it will not be only iodine treatment that you have. You'll have another kind of treatment. Find out that kind of treatment from the Bible. And then you will treat people in that way. You'll give them tender care loving care you'll give them that sincere intimate and spiritual care the pastor as a spiritual shepherd he'll protect he will guide and he will feed the people of god the pastor feeds the sheep how many times regularly he searches out lost sheep he delivers the captive sheep he gathers dispersed sheep together he makes the weary sheep to rest he binds and anoints hurt sheep and he will strengthen the weak sheep and he will guide the directionless sheep and he will carry the wounded sheep in his bosom and restore the sheep that are strained he will reassure the frightened sheep you see what the shepherd has to do to deliver the sheep when they are captive gather them together when they are dispersed and give them rest when they are weary, worn out. Bind them when they are hurt. He will strengthen them when they are weak. When they are motionless and directionless and fearful of the direction to follow. He will gently guide them and say, go this way, go that way. And it is a shepherd that will carry the wounded ones, the weak ones. He will restore those that have gone astray. And when you are frightened, he will reassure you. He will say, there is nothing to frighten you. God is still on the throne. That is a real pastor. You know why our churches are not growing? You know why our members are getting discouraged? You know why our members are not really moving forward? We don't have enough pastors. We have many people that are called pastors, but we do not have enough pastors that will fulfill the function of the pastor. The pastor must provide the sheep fold for the sheep. Protect them from robbers and false doctrine. Protect them from the false prophets and the wolves. And he will lead the way for the sheep to follow. He will know each sheep. And the sheep will know his voice. And he will give up or lay down all he has. If need be his life for the benefit of the sheep. That's what we have read in John chapter 10. Let's look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Reading from verse 28. Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Know how precious the church is. It's the purchase of God. Christ has purchased the sheep and the flock with his own blood. And what are we going to do? We're to make sure that we tenderly take care of them. And we feed them. And we watch over them. Well, these characteristics are found in the natural shepherd. And they are to be applied to the spiritual shepherd of God's people. The shepherd is a watchman over his flock. He has to be alert because of the many different kinds of dangers that could come upon the flock without prior notice. As a watchman over the flock, the pastor is to be the most diligent. For there are many enemies that will come against the church of God in these last days now if you try to recall all the things we have been teaching in these leadership studies leadership study one study two and now study three you will see that there are great requirements that god places upon us as leaders in the church and what do we say the question is who is sufficient for these things the answer is none of us will be able to do this without the grace of god in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. To the one were the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? All these qualities and qualifications are read to you on the life of the pastor as a father, as a shepherd, who can do all this, all alone by himself. Who is sufficient for these things? There is none of us. Our sufficiency is of God. Chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient for ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And if we are willing to be the real leader God wants us to be, I pray God can qualify us. And God will equip us in Jesus' name. And God will be our sufficiency. As pastors, as leaders, as coordinators or zonal leaders or whatever responsibilities we have, let us look at all these qualifications and tell God, Lord, I know that I am not fully perfected, fully matured yet in my leadership role, but I want to be. I want to be like a real shepherd. I want to be like a real father. Help me and the Lord will help you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. God is our sufficiency. He will help you. He will give you all the qualities you need to be a real shepherd, to be a real father. He'll give you the tenderness. He'll give you the love. He'll give you everything you need so that you'll be the kind of leader and the kind of pastor that you ought to be. We are standing before you at this moment as our father. We are also standing before you as our great shepherd. We are also before you, our God, as our great leader. And in the name of Christ Jesus, we want to express our thanks to you for these precious things that our ears have heard. We want to admit before you that we have heard your word. We have seen ourselves in the light of the truth revealed and we fall short. Father, we have had fathers of this world. We have observed some things about them and somehow we have carried those observations into this holy ministry. The way our earthly fathers have treated us is the same way we have been treating the flock, the people, your own precious children you have put us over as fathers. And in doing this, we have so many times wounded the feelings of the children. Father, we are asking that this afternoon the spirit of conviction will work upon our hearts that we will not be negligent, we will not be indifferent, but will actually break ourselves down before you, see the gravity of this 